work, school, ball game, homework. As a family, some days we're happy to simply survive. But what if we could turn surviving into thriving? Well, join us tonight in Hudson Hall for Thrive, a Journey on at Home focus event as we take a look at common challenges even the best families face. Thrive is designed for parents and other key influencers in the home. It includes breakout sessions on topics like building family identity, parenting teenagers, defending your family from the world's influence, how to best affirm your children, the role of grandparents, and more. This Journey on at Home focus event is free. I encourage you to check out the insert in today's bulletin. And for more information, visit BrentwoodBaptist.com slash journey on at home. Smashing some stuff, exotic meats, paintball, zip lines. What could I be talking about? Anvil 2014. Anvil is a guy's retreat designed to focus on Christian brotherhood while digging deep into the Bible. This year, we'll be focusing on heroes of scripture and how their faith catapulted them towards a God-honoring lifestyle. We're calling it Heroes, Feats of Faith. You better get to Linden Valley, Tennessee for small groups, worship, and manliness that is in the very DNA of Anvil. And dads, this retreat is also for you to walk alongside of your sons. You don't want to miss this retreat on February 28th and March 1st. Ah, uh, yeah, if you don't go, you're a joker. <laughs> Sign up today at BrentwoodBaptist.com slash students. Noted author and speaker, Dr. Donald Whitney says, the only road to Christian maturity and godliness passes through the practice of the spiritual disciplines. Join Dr. Whitney here at Brentwood Baptist Church on Friday and Saturday, February 21st and 22nd for this year's Immersion Conference. Spiritual practices, habits to help you be more like Christ. Dr. Whitney will share practical insights for real people and introduce you to biblical practices and habits that will help you look more like Jesus and go deeper than ever in your relationship with Him. Sign up online today and get Dr. Whitney's book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, as a free gift. Immersion 2014, Spiritual Practices, in Hudson Hall. Sign up and learn more at BrentwoodBaptist.com slash Immersion. I just somehow thought all I needed to do was help Jesus save souls. And then I discovered as I read the Word of God, I was wrong. Jesus wanted me to help save people. Here's a group of people at its core, a local church, who is saying, we are going to do something about this. Hi, I'm Aaron Bryant, the Kairos Pastor. I have the privilege of leading the young adult congregation here at Brentwood Baptist Church. Welcome to worship. If you're a first time guest, we'd love for you to register your visit with us by completing a communication card. These are in the pew racks in front of you or in your bulletin if you're worshiping with us in Hudson Hall. And remember, anyone can use this card to update contact information or to submit a prayer request so that our prayer team can be praying for you. Just drop your card in the offering a little bit later in the service. Now, let's begin our time of worship together. Good morning, church. Let's stand together in the house of the Lord. Let's read God's word together. Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. What a privilege we have today to exalt the name of the Lord. Let's sing together. So let your name be lifted higher to our God. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let
people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph this morning. God's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our praise. Psalm 47 says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome. Let's sing together. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. and sing worthy
Christ, that you may be seated.
I'm not going to talk too much before our prayer time today because I feel like we really just opened our prayer time with that song. Uh, All of my days were made for you. Lord, I give my life as a sacrifice to you. The phrases in that song are from the heart, sung straight to the Lord. And that's what we're here today to do, to give the Lord our all. I was reminded of the verse this morning in 1 Peter chapter 3. says that he, speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. It's my prayer today. Lord, help me live to righteousness. Help me live in a way that you can say I'm living for you. Our prayer time this morning, uh, we're going to focus on our time here together, but we also want to focus on uh, offering you a reminder uh, uh, to pray often, to pray uh, without ceasing as the Bible teaches us. In your bulletin this morning, as soon as you open it on the left side there, Uh, there's a little silver cross. You can just peel that right off of your bulletin. And I'd encourage you to put that in your pocket or in your purse, uh, something that you'll you'll see often. Uh, Sit it on the counter next to your keys and put it in your pocket each and every day when you you grab your keys to leave. And use that cross as a reminder to pray, a reminder to pray maybe for the names that you wrote on your Oikos card, maybe the names of your neighbors, uh, or just to pray for Brentwood Baptist and the call that God has placed on this church uh, in respect to the Middle Tennessee Initiative, uh, that God would use us to reach the state and to reach the world for him. But use that cross as a reminder today uh, to pray. The cross is such a symbol, isn't it? Such a symbol of who Christ is and what he's done for us. And truly, we can say today, God, we're made to live for you. You created us so we could bring you glory. Our pastor will be here praying. I know many of you would like to come and pray over him, that God will use him in this service today. And this altar is open. You may have a need. You may want to use this space down here to pray. You may want to make the seat you're at an altar. Uh, Whatever the situation this morning, let's give this time to the Lord. Let's pray together. You bore our sins in your body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by your wounds, we were healed. Lord, we're changed by the gospel today. Thank you. Thank you for the service. Thank you for for the songs we've been able to lift to you and to sing to you and to let your name be lifted higher and higher in this place. We want to make much of you this morning because you're worthy. Lord, I pray that you would be with our pastor. Thank you for him. Thank you for his leadership. And I pray that you'll speak through him mightily in our time together today. Lord, use these uh, crosses today as reminders for us um, to, um, to pray, but Lord, just to to live for you, to to live every moment as an act of worship to you. How we long to live to righteousness. You're worthy today. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, coming together with other believers to lift up your name. For the soul here today, God, that doesn't know you, 
who has never met you and never received you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Change lives today and draw us all closer to you and save the lost this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. If you're joining us in Hudson Hall, you will find one of these journals on the table or in the, uh, if you're in the stands there, bleachers, you will find it at the end of the row. If you're here, you will find them at the end of the pew. Now, some pews have more than others because of uh, the first service, 930 service being in here. And if uh, you are at a pew that has more than you need on your pew, if you would kind of help look around and make sure everybody gets one. Now, we want everybody to get one. Now, parents, you discern what is best for your child. Some, child, some children with their own, and other children uh, would be better, uh, would do it better if you them. So that's your call, and, uh, and you, do, you do what is best for you and your family there. Uh, we want this to be part of your life journey, your spiritual journey for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we want you to spend some time reminding yourself of the stories uh, that made Brentwood Baptist Church and how we are u uniquely positioned to be part of what God is up to in the Middle Tennessee Initiative right now. Uh, you'll hear some more about the, um, uh, the design of the Middle Tennessee, this actual strategy in there, and you'll see the, the stuff that is happening in Station Hill and in the Nashville campus. And did you see the new name of the Nashville campus on the back? The church at Avenue South. Uh, they're uh, located on 8th Avenue South. 12th Avenue South is the hub. So they just dropped the number and called it Avenue South. That's what creative people do. And, uh, and so, and now that's been shortened to Ave South, the church at Ave South. So uh, it sounds like a, a, a cold medicine to me, but, uh, but uh, they're, they're excited about it. We've had almost 100 people sign up to be part of that new church start and they are working right now and we're hoping uh, in a few weeks you'll hear about the new start date for them there is a, a section for your devotional readings uh, for your uh, your life groups small group work and of course there at the end uh, the last chapter is a place for you and your family to work through how you will financially be committed to uh, the uh, the work here in the middle tennessee initiative because it takes both it takes the financial commitment and the commitment of, uh, of, your, of your work. Now, we're looking, uh, asking God to provide $17 million. Uh, $13 million of it is to, is to do the first phase construction of the Station Hill campus. Now, you're saying, wow, how do we have to spend so much money down there? Because there's nothing down there yet. Uh, some of you live in, in Spring Hill, Thompson Station. Everything is new down there. Uh, everybody started moving in there. We didn't know that Spring Hill existed until they put the plant down there. And now everybody's moving in there. And uh, everybody's discovering the beauty of Middle Tennessee and, and showing up down there. You know, the Bird King's new down there. The restaurants are new. Jay Strother comes up and announces every week, hey, we got a new restaurant, whatever. And there's big news because they used to have to go all the way to Franklin uh, for stuff like that. Uh, there, there's not a facility down there that can support the work uh, that Station Hill needs to do. So we'll need to build it. Uh, we've already bought the land, and uh, it's one of the highest points in Spring Hill. And there's $13 million to put the facility there. You need a place to worship. You need a place to do discipleship. You need a place to do uh, uh, community work, education, uh, to work with children and students. Everybody needs a place. And so place is important. Two million is to help the, the Nashville campus get started and the, and the refurbishing there, the, uh, the church at Avenue South. And two million is to help churches be uh, repurposed. There are a lot of churches in the middle of Tennessee area where the neighborhood around them has changed and they've got new opportunities. And uh, you're already started hearing about some of those churches. What surprised me about the Middle Tennessee Initiative is, is when we started talking about it, when we started doing the research and other people found out what we were doing, churches started calling us. Will you come? Will you, will you come work with us? Will you, can we be part of what you're doing? And so before we knew it, uh, we already had how God was laying out some things uh, for us, and we can see how God wants to work in, 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 in some communities, and we're eager for, for those opportunities. We'll be uh, looking to provide staff for these opportunities and training those pastors and worship leaders and disciplers 
and recreational outreach leaders and those kind of things. And some of you are going to be part of that because, yes, we're asking for money, but we're also asking for you. That's a, the unique thing about the Middle Tennessee Initiative is that some of you will be part of the staffs of these new churches. Some of you will be part of the leadership of these new churches. Uh, some of you will be part of Brentwood Baptist Church at another location. Uh, and so as you talk to your families, you talk, uh, as you pray, uh, ask how God wants to use your gift sets and your, because there are more opportunities in Middle Tennessee than anywhere I know. Uh, we cannot get a missionary into Saudi Arabia. Uh, we can't get a missionary into many Muslim nations. So why do you think there's so many Muslims in Middle Tennessee? God brought them right here and we don't even have to get on an airplane to do work with Muslim people who need to know Jesus Christ. Uh, more first generation in immigrants than anywhere else in the nation right here. Now where would you live if you were getting off an airplane in New York and they said you can live anywhere? Well I'd go to Middle Tennessee. Can't blame them. At least we know they're that smart. So we'll start a church, and that church will, will become a community center where we do the health care, where we do the poverty uh, initiatives, where, where, where we do education initiatives. But don't, don't, uh, mis un don't, uh, don't misunderstand what we're doing. Every moment, every facility is an outpost to proclaim Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't do any good to put a, a warm coat on a frozen heart. Or help a family do their finances when the real struggle is they're not really a family. And that's something that only Jesus can do. Now, James does warn us, don't walk around patting everybody on the head saying, Jesus be with you and they're cold and you're holding two coats. Okay? Well, that is, we, we, we have that. We understand that. But let's not, let's not think that, serve, that, that solving physical or personal problems is going gonna, is gonna to fix it. If money was the end of poverty, then the federal government would have fixed it. But, 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 but that's not the problem. If you, you want to do something with poverty? You want to do something with crime? You know how you do it? Champion marriage. That's how you do it. You put a godly man and a godly woman in a godly home, raising up godly children, and you impact poverty. You impact crime. Go see how many Father's Day cards are mailed from the prison. The problem is most of those men in prison don't know their dads. Dad wasn't there. And now they're having babies and they're not there. And the cycle starts all over again. Yes, we'll do all of those social initiatives, all those personal initiatives. But we're always going to be talking about Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection that gives us the power to overcome all of the cycles that keep us broken as people and as a society. And that's why this, this issue is, more, is, is so important. Now, I, I've been doing this a long time, and, and I know this is the spot where I'm supposed to show you a picture of a baby or of a puppy. And you're supposed to get really emotional and all charged up to give, but the last thing in the world I want to do is emotionally manipulate you because here is the bad news about the Middle Tennessee Initiative. It doesn't stop. So after the two years of working with Station Hill and Ave South and getting other churches, we're going to be back. And we're going to be talking about the new opportunities that God has opened up for us. So if you're one of those people that doesn't like being talked to about me, oh, you're going to hate the next bunch of years because we're going to be doing this a lot. Because why? The reward for good work is what? More work. Right? And if we respond to these opportunities that God gives us in repurposing these churches and opening new campuses and reaching new people, He's going to give us more opportunities that's going to require more money and more of you, more time, more resources, more effort. So this thing doesn't end. I don't want you emotionally manipulated and me get you up on some high and you give all to I want your heart broken. 
I want you worried about the person that bags your groceries. I want you to find out whether the bank teller knows Jesus Christ or your kids' teachers know Jesus Christ. I want you to find out about your office workers and, and your colleagues in your career. I want you to be worried about those people and praying about those people and getting to the place where you'll kneel down in front of Jesus and say, whatever it takes, we'll do. Whatever the answer, question is for me, the answer to you, Jesus, is yes. That's where we want to go. I want your heart broken. So that the only thing that matters is Middle Tennessee coming to know Jesus Christ. And we'll pay any price that is required to get that message out. That's what I'm praying for. And the reason this moment is so important, it is a moment of worship. It is a moment. And I wish the offering plates were bigger. I wish the buckets in Hudson Hall were bigger. Bigger than the space for an envelope or a check. If they were big enough for you to get in, for me to get in. Because make no mistake, what we're giving right now is ourselves. <laughs> through the symbol, through the token of offering, through the symbol, through the token of tithe. But what we're really giving is ourselves. Let's pray together. As the ushers come forward, in Hudson Hall, you'll find the blue buckets at the end of your row or on the table there. Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children. Receive them in great joy because they're given that way. We're mindful of how you have loved us, taken care of us. So we pray now that you will use these gifts to bring glory and honor to your name that is above every name. So we pray this in your name. morning you've received a My Next Journal. As we enter the stewardship phase of our emphasis on the Middle Tennessee Initiative, we want to provide you with a tool that you can use to record how God is speaking to you through the sermons, Bible studies, and your own personal devotional time. The first section gives you the history of our church from the perspective of Pastor Mike Glenn. He's been a part of more than half of our church's history, and this section captures some God-sized stories from the past. This is intended to demonstrate that our past is an integral part of our future. Church multiplication, the heart of the Middle Tennessee Initiative, is in our DNA. It's who we are. The next section outlines the need, the opportunities, and the calling that is before us as we embark upon the next stewardship campaign. It gives you an explanation of what the Middle Tennessee Initiative is and why we're encouraging you to be a part of it. The next section provides a place for sermon notes. We encourage you to use this over the next five weeks to write down how God is speaking to you each Sunday morning and revisit that throughout the week during your prayer time. Then there's a devotional and prayer journal. As you spend time studying scripture and reflecting on your notes from Sunday's sermon, write down what God is revealing to you. These devotionals follow the Journey On Today daily Bible readings that are part of our annual discipleship strategy. Then there's a section for Bible studies. Many of the life groups will be using this section for the next five weeks for their Bible study. This gives you one resource that lets you keep all the things that God is teaching you in one easy to use place. The final section in this book is the Commitment Guide. As we reach the commitment phase of the campaign, this section will help you to pray about and determine how God is leading you to give and be a part of this campaign. For the next five weeks, we want you to use this journal and allow God to prepare you for your next, for our next, and for His next. My wife, Jeannie, is staying home with my mother who was staying with us, she had um, a shunt uh, placed in her, uh, uh, in her head. Um, and so she was, that, that surgery was Friday, she was home Saturday, you know, brain surgery fr Friday, home Saturday. And so she is, uh, mom apologized for not coming to church this morning. A little thing like brain surgery gets you down, thought you were tougher. Uh, so, uh, so Jeannie, Texted me and said, how do I, you know, get the service on iPad? And so I texted her back the instructions. And I said, how do I look? And she, and, and she got it just as Yunhan Guo was doing baptism. So she texted back, you look Chinese. <laughs> I 
I'm translated to Spanish. You ought to hear me in Spanish. I sound wonderful. I'm just... And then all kind of things happening in and around Brentwood Baptist Church. So, man, if you're looking for something, we've got a place to, that your gifts will make a difference. So, make sure you find that. Um, every, every team, every organization has that one person that makes everybody in the office better. Everybody in the organization better. Uh, sometimes you'll see a team that has a lot of very gifted athletes, but for whatever reason, they just can't seem to pull it together and win the championship. Then they will bring in that one person that makes the whole team play better. There's just something about the galvanizing presence of that person. Uh, you'll see it sometimes in business. There would be a good idea and a good plan, but somehow they just can't get it executed until this one important hire is made. And then all of a sudden, everybody works better. For the New Testament church, that one important person was a guy named Barnabas. Now, the interesting thing about Barnabas is we all know him by Barnabas. That's his nickname. Now, the disciples gave him that nickname. His real name is Joseph. But we won't hear that much. You'll hear Barnabas. So at a critical time in the church's history, in the early church's history, when the church was under a lot of pressure, it was Barnabas that stepped up and made everything work better in the early church. And what Barnabas did for the New Testament church, I want Brentwood Baptist Church, I want you to be part of in Middle Tennessee. Now to understand what that is, let's begin by reading one of those Barnabas stories that you'll find in Acts chapter 4. Stand with me in, in honor of God's Word as we read the last two paragraphs. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. And with great power the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all of those who owned lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet. Then this was distributed to each person as anyone had need. Joseph, a Levite, a Cypriot by birth, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Joseph, a Levite, a Cypriot by birth, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which translated means son of encouragement. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As Barnabas was to the early church, make us now to your postmodern church. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So they nicknamed him Barnabas. Now, just from the nickname Barnabas, you can kind of get a, a, a hint on, uh, on the kind of person he might have been. <laughs> he was probably a morning person. Yeah, have those people just wake up cheery and just, hi, good morning, this is a great day. I hate those people. <laughs> Leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anybody till after coffee. And then I want to meditate on it a little bit. But, you know, he was probably that kind of person. He, he was probably, you know, everybody worked hard and did better because he was always bringing a ton of energy. And the New Testament church needed a lot. Now, I know we have this thing about romanticizing particular times of history. And we always think it was better then, it was better then. And, uh, and we all want to go back to the good old days. Well, I don't ever want to go back to a place that doesn't have air conditioning. Count me out. Okay, I'm done with that. And, and, and sometimes when you talk to people who lived in the good old days, you find out they weren't all that good. Okay, now, we have this thing about, oh, we could just get back like the first century church. Really? Really? Well, let's look at what's going on in the first century church. In the first, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, they are scared and scattered. And Jesus appears to them in a, in a series of appearances. And one of the things he does is he offers to, he, he brings them the second great commission, which is the Acts 1-8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And, and that's the verse that is very important to this congregation. Uh, chapter 2, they are praying, and Pentecost happens. And they're at, at the end of chapter 2, they are pray, uh, preaching in the middle of downtown Jerusalem. 
thousands of people come to know Christ, and the church is born in that moment. Uh, chapter 3, Peter and John are on the way to prayer, and a, and a man who, who, who is crippled calls out to them for alms, for, for, for charity. And, and Peter turns around and says, we don't have silver, we don't have gold, but what we do have we'll give to you in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. So the man is healed, the man's healing causes quite a disturbance that breaks out into a small riot. So Peter and John are arrested and brought before the religious leaders who tell them don't ever preach before, uh, don't ever preach in the name of Jesus again. Peter's famous response, whether it is right to obey God or men, you'll have to figure out, but we're only bringing testimony of what we have seen and heard. They go out, start preaching again, they're arrested again, this time they're beaten and they're dismissed from the Sanhedrin with a stern warning never to preach in the name of Jesus again, but they do. And not only that, but they thank God that they have lived in such a way that they were recognized as a follower of Jesus Christ. They responded to the suffering with great joy, gratitude, even a sense of relief. Thank God they know we're believers. They get the early church together and the pressure begins to mount. And it's so much so that some of them are losing jobs. It's hard for, for some of them to make ends meet. Some of them have been thrown out of their families. And so the church takes care of each other. So the heat that the world put on the church intending to destroy the church galvanizes the church, melts the church together. So much so that Luke tells us that they were of one heart and one soul. They became a body together. One loved the other, the other loved the other, and what I have is yours, what, you're ha what you have is, is, is mine, and if we need something, then the other provides it. Now, some people have misunderstood this as communism, socialism, all that. There's no hint of that. Here's what happens. You get close to Jesus. Jesus begins to fill your life, okay? As Jesus begins to fill your life, all the junk in your life is washed out and floats away. The things in your life that you were using to mark your prestige, to define your identity, to give your life meaning and purpose, those things in your life that you were looking to bless you, okay? I must be cool, look at my car. I must be successful, look at my house. See, that the house gives my life meaning, the car gives my life meaning. I must be cool, look at my clothes. When you begin to realize that that kind of blessing and that kind of love, that kind of authority only comes from Jesus. Nowhere else, nobody else. And you begin to realize, if I don't need this car to love me back, then maybe I don't need the car. And you sell the car. The, the apostles never, never said to anybody, sell everything and bring it. That was never part of their sermon. Take care of the poor was. But it was never sell everything and bring it. Just people just got full of Jesus, didn't need much else. And so they brought it all, and that was the way the church took care of each other. Now, later that becomes a problem because the, the apostles tell the early church, we don't have time to do all the benevolence work because it's taken away from Bible study and prayer. And now we have the calling of the first deacons in chapter 6. But here at the end of chapter 4, we're introduced to a very interesting man by the name of Barnabas. And Barnabas is introduced to us, why? Because he is the prototypical Christian. He's doing what everybody else is doing. And we want you to show you in one person's life what every other believer is doing. What does Barnabas do? He sells some property, brings it to the church, gives it to the apostles, and the apostles distribute it as it is needed. Now, he gives all of the money because he felt that was what he was led to do. There's no demand that he do that. That's just what he does. Now, chapter 5, we have another couple who sell a piece of land and bring part of the money. And when the disciples ask, is this all the money? They lie to the disciples, and they die in church. Now, that stewardship message is there if I need it. <laughs> Not going to throw it yet. Just know we have that pitch if we need it. But let's stay with Barnabas right now. Here's some interesting things we know about Barnabas. Barnabas was very generous in his giving. Second, 
He was the one that the church trusted, the church in Jerusalem trusted, to go church to check out what was happening in Antioch. There was a revival breaking out in Antioch. As the Christians were run out of Jerusalem, they ended up in Antioch. A revival breaks out the first place. They're called Christian, little, little Jesus, little Christian, little Christ, is in Antioch. Barnabas goes to Antioch to validate the work of the Spirit there. When he sees this is a Jesus thing, that it is a work of the Spirit, he recognizes they need teaching. They need somebody who can ground them in the faith. And he leaves and go gets Paul. And brings Paul, who was in Tarsus, brings Paul back to Antioch. Barnabas is the first pulpit committee, a one-man pulpit committee. Goes and gets Paul, brings him back, and establishes Paul as one of the teachers in the church in Antioch. Barnabas and Paul stay in that church and teach, grow the disciples, deepen the disciples. Acts chapter 13, a prophet stands up and says, Two people of our church have been set aside for missionary work, and it was Paul and it was Barnabas. And so Barnabas goes with Paul on the very first missionary journey. They come back, they plant churches, they start the work. They come back, they celebrate what God is doing, and now they want to go back. Paul wants to go back and encourage the churches where they've been. Barnabas wants to go with him, but he wants to take John Mark. Now, John Mark had been on the first, but got homesick or sick or lonely or tired and quit. Paul seems to have seen it as a matter of cowardice under fire and dismissed John Mark. Wouldn't have anything else to do with him. Barnabas wouldn't give up on him. Barnabas argued with Paul so intensely and defended John Mark so strongly that Paul and Barnabas have to agree to disagree. And Paul picks Silas and goes on the next missionary journey, and that's where the New Testament continues with Paul and Silas. It's Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. We do not hear anything else about Barnabas. He drops out of the story. He gives up his career, his position, his place in ministry to protect the future leadership. Now, he, he protects John Mark. Now, we don't have anything else from Barnabas. We do have from John Mark. At the end of 2 Timothy, there's a note from Paul. Please send John Mark to me. He is such an encouragement to me. Whoa. We don't know what changed. We don't know how it changed. We know Barnabas wouldn't let John Mark go. Can you imagine what would have happened? If, if, if the last thing John Mark had heard was Paul saying, You're not, you, you failed, I'm not going to take you anywhere, what happens if John Mark leaves? Well, we don't have that little sentence in 2 Timothy. We don't have the second gospel. John Mark. Mark wrote the second gospel. We wouldn't have the great little line that if you spend too much time in church like I did, you find. In the arrest of Jesus, there's a story in the gospel of Mark about a young man who was there. The soldiers grabbed this young man, and the young man says, I would have been arrested, but I slipped out of my robe, and I ran away naked. Now, when you're 14 in church, that's the funniest story you've ever heard in your life. Okay? The first streaker was in the Bible. Okay? Now, there's no reason for that story to be in there. It makes no sense. It breaks the flow, everything, unless it's the author's way, unless it's John's Mark, John Mark's way of saying, listen, I was there. I barely got away with my skin. Matthew starts to write his gospel. What book does he use as an outline? Mark. Luke starts to write his gospel. What book does he use as an outline? Mark. Unless Barnabas makes this courageous stand here in the book of Acts... Not only do we lose the second gospel, but the first and third gospels are greatly diminished because Paul, because Paul would have dismissed John Mark, Barnabas defended the future leadership. What a guy. What, 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 a, what an amazing person that you and I are given as a model and now called to be. You know, one of the things that, that frustrates me about Jesus, of many things that frustrate me about Jesus, <laughs> I, I know y'all want more from me, but sometimes that's all I got. Uh, sometimes you'll pray that Jesus will help you with the problem, and I want Jesus to grab me and throw me on the other side of the problem. 
And I'm going to go, Phew, that was close. That's not what he does. He takes you right through the problem. So if you pray, and Lord, help me with this person. I got a bad attitude toward this person. You're going to see that person every time you go to the grocery store, every time you get gas. And I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. They'll be everywhere. Jesus will give you a lot of opportunities to work through it. And if you just, okay. But I didn't understand for a long time. Then I finally understood the reason Jesus does that is so that whatever that problem is, you don't have to be afraid of it. See, sometimes if you sneak around a problem or run by a problem, you're always afraid this problem's going to come back and get you. Uh uh-uh, not with Jesus. You go and you face it. You deal with it. And then when it comes back again in your head going, oh, well, we, you know, Jesus walked us through that. We're fine. See, now, let me tell you something else. I don't like. You, you're walking through life and you say, okay, I want to stop. I want to follow Jesus. Repent. Bam. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to repent, which means turn, walk a new way. Now, here's what they don't tell you. Okay, that walking a new way is fine. But what they don't tell you is you walk into the current of culture. See, when you're walking with culture, it's all flowing with you. It's easy. Okay, you repent, you turn into it, it's all flowing to you. So all this junk that is floating by you is now flowing at you. They don't tell you that. Only Uncle Mike will let you in on that little secret. Now, you would think that'd be bad enough. Here's the worst part. Jesus takes you to the worst part of the world. And you're going, oh, I don't want to go to that neighborhood. That's where Jesus goes. The doctor is after the ones who are sick. The shepherd is after the ones who are lost. And sheep don't get lost in easy, convenient places. So there's some of us who say the world is broken. It's a mess. Yes, it is. That's not news. So what we need to do as Christians is retreat, get our, get, our, get our own little gospel ghetto, just hang around Christians, talk to other Christians, don't do anything else with other Christians. And some of you, when we talk about evangelism, you're going, oh gosh, I don't even know anybody who's not a Christian. Jesus did not say retreat. I don't know of an army yet that wins by retreating. Jesus said, go to those places that are messed up the most, and that's where I want you to do your work. That's where I want you to live your life. You call to those. Some of you are frustrated right now because you're the only Christian in your office. And you talk to your friends. The language is bad. The attitude is bad. Everybody's so negative and hateful. I just, I just hate my job. I hate being there. I'm the only Christian. Will you pray that I get a new job? No. We won't. Before you got there, there were no Christians in the office. Now we have one. And God has established a significant beachhead there that you're called to live out the person of Jesus Christ and the glory and the power of his resurrection right in front of your unbelieving colleagues. Now now you're going, well, Mike, they make fun of me. Yeah, they sure do. Mike, they hurt my feelings. Yes, they do. They're me. Yes, they are. Bear it in the power of the risen Christ. Did you think it would be easy? No, it may be months, it may be years, but it will happen. When somebody steps into your office, sticks their head around your cubicle and says, you're a Christian, aren't you? Have you got a minute? Here's what's going on in my marriage. Here's what's going on in my life. Here's what's going on in my family. I don't know what to do. Will you pray for me? Can I talk to you? And you'll have the chance then to share the good news of who Jesus Christ is because you would have borne it. And you would have lived it out for the opportunity to preach. Make no mistake. Every time we help somebody with a poverty issue, whether it's getting ready for a job interview or learning how to budget their money, we want to do it so we can tell them how important they are to Jesus Christ and that he's died for them so they can have a new relationship with the resurrected Christ. Yes, we'll do the health care things. Yes, we'll do the education things. Yes, we'll have a community center of ministry. And it's always about proclaiming Jesus Christ is Lord. Always. Jason Gray is a contemporary worship leader. He has a song. He has a song called Every Act of Love. The words go something like this. He's made a million, million doors for his love to walk through. And one of those doors is you. 
He's made a million, million doors for his love to walk through. And one of those doors is you. Maybe you're Barnabas and you show up with a gift at the right time. Maybe you're Barnabas and you're part of a new work. Maybe you're Barnabas and you go on missions. Maybe you're Barnabas and you're training the leadership for the next generation. But one of those doors is you. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, while you're thinking about your own life. For some of you, it's as simple as becoming a member of Brentwood Baptist Church. And we have our membership counselors waiting for you in the parlor. It's right across uh, the foyer here, right outside the sanctuary. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you. We'd love to have the opportunity to, uh, to help you get that process started. Maybe, maybe life's just been hard. Sometimes life does that. You just get jumped. And you just need to know that somebody's praying for you. We would consider it an honor to share these moments of the journey with you. Or maybe, maybe it's the first time you have thought about what God wants you to do with your life. And maybe it's a readjustment of your finances. Maybe it is selling something. I, I, I don't know how God will work in your life. Maybe it is getting some things straight so you have some capacity to respond to how God wants to lead you. Maybe it's about the first relationship Maybe if you sit there, you, you have never really thought about a relationship with Jesus Christ. You just know there's things messed up. You can't fix it. Hear me. You can't fix what you've broken. You can't undo what you have done. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And through his death and his resurrection, he's paid for those mistakes, paid for those sins, and now offers you a life that by calling him Savior, by calling him Lord, he will give you that life that you have never dreamed about living whatever it is. Jesus is waiting for you right where you are. I beg you, don't leave this moment with those decisions unmade. Jesus is waiting for you where you are. We're waiting for you as you will come. Lord Jesus, every heart is now open, every life. So we pray, Jesus, that the choices we make now will be exactly what you want. And we pray this in your name. We'll stand and sing together. To the Lord. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish, Thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. God bless you all. Have a great afternoon.